Hi, I'm Larry Micarenda, and welcome again to this edition Excelsior Forum. Continuing with our medical series, and uh, we're really great and glad to have him on, is Dr. Nikul Kokari, who is an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to be here, Larry. Um, we have so many topics to go on because medical uh, you know, and technology seem to be merging and, and, and going on. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about your, your background yourself? Sure. I'm an orthopedic joint replacement surgeon. So I have fellowship training in joint replacement surgery, metabolic bone disorders, sports and orthopedic trauma. But what I specialize in today and the focus of my practice today is joint replacement surgery, especially hips and knees. I was going to ask you uh, one of our first questions because um, a lot of things going on with hips. Now, especially when people get over 40, 45, uh, you hear all this stuff about osteoporosis, <laughs> calcium deficiency, and everything like that. It could be a small fall. It could be a lot of things. How do people know when is the time to come and, and see a doctor about their hip? So what I tell my patients is we want them to be active and pain-free. It's extremely important for patients to maintain their activity level. Otherwise, uh, the muscles atrophy and um, it's not good for them in the long term. If a certain activity bothers you, I ask them to slow down on that activity for some time, take over-the-counter medications. But if the pain continues, it's very important to get an orthopedic evaluation so that the problem can be nipped in the bud. Now, what are some of the symptoms that you would have with hip, hip pain? You know, would it be just normal walking, you know, or there? So hip arthritis, uh, which is most of the problem that I deal with on a regular basis, presents as pain in the groin. It presents as pain in the front of the hip. Patients have uh, trouble with pain and stiffness. They have trouble getting in and out of the car, going up and down stairs. When patients get into the car, they may need to lift their leg up with their hands because of the pain in the groin. It's very important to differentiate pain that is coming from the back, from the hip pain, because it's the same nerve that supplies the back and the hip. As a matter of fact, hip arthritis can sometimes present with knee pain because it's the same nerve that supplies the back, hip, and the knee. And that's why a clinical examination is extremely important in the evaluation of patients with hip and knee pain. Now, people refer to sciatica. Is that the sciatic nerve that you're talking about? This, there are three nerves, the sciatic nerve, the obturator nerve, and the femoral nerve. Um, but uh, because it's the same nerve that supplies the two joints and the skin overlying the joint, it sends a message to the brain that the pain is coming from all of the three places. Um, I do a thorough clinical evaluation, and the clinical evaluation usually can differentiate back pain from hip pain and knee pain. We also do other diagnostic tests like x-rays. Um, if there is ever any confusion on where the pain is coming from, then we may need additional investigations like an MRI. There are very rare occasions that we cannot even differentiate where the pain is coming from, and under those circumstances, we inject a painful joint with a numbing medication, something like lidocaine or marcaine, and once that injection goes inside the joint, that pain goes away. So we know exactly mm -hmm. where the pain is coming from. So it helps you narrow it down. Now, uh, a lot of people hear hip re replacement and they get scared and, and terrified. Uh, that might have been the case 20, 30 years ago. Now, um, we had talked before the show and you told me you have some patients who get the hip surgery and you know, they're up in, on their feet in no time. Can you explain a little bit about sure. that? Sure, so today we have some fascinating technologies uh, and we, that has allowed us to make remarkable changes in the way we treated patients with hip and knee arthritis. Today we have newer designs, uh, less invasive techniques, and um, better materials that have allowed us to do joints in uh, very young patients and younger and younger patients also are now candidates because of these newer technologies. Most patients are able to get up and walk the same day of surgery. They can put as much weight as they want to on their leg. Next day they're walking with a walker then eventually with no support at all. Joint replacement surgery is one of the most gratifying surgeries in orthopedics today. 
I would have to say that, you know, someone comes into your office, they're on crutches, can't walk or in a wheelchair, and then after surgery a day or two, they're walking into your office and talking to you like it's nothing happened at all, right? Orthopedic <laughs> joint replacement surgery is very gratifying. It takes time for patients to get better. Uh, the pain that they had before the surgery is gone after the surgery. What they do have is surgical pain which gets better with time. Hip replacement surgery is a little more gratifying than knee replacement surgery because the pain after surgery is gone within a few days. Knee replacement surgery involves a lot of rehabilitation and um, I tell my patients that they are not happy in four weeks. Uh, it takes about six weeks for them to see light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Now three months they are significantly better as against hip. Hip replacement patients are doing pretty well uh, within a few weeks time. Now, as far as like prevention is concerned, um, you know, is like walking good for people who have arthritis in their hips? So arthritis uh, is multifactorial. It, there are many reasons why patients develop arthritis. A big factor is genetics. Uh, your parents may have arthritis, your grandparents may have arthritis, and that's one of the reasons why patients develop arthritis, especially as they grow older. There are certain types of arthritis that are associated with um, certain disorders like a vascular necrosis or gout, um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and we have excellent medications for that today to keep the patient's uh, joints healthy and active and avoid the need for joint replacement surgery. However, um, as I mentioned before, we want patients to be active and pain-free. Uh, walking um, typically is encouraged. What we don't want patients to do is any impact type of activity mm. because that's going to increase the pain from the arthritis. Swimming is an excellent exercise. What happens is even for patients who are not able to swim, they can walk in the water and that offloads the weight of the joint and maintains muscle bulk and flexibility. So swimming is an excellent exercise for patients who have arthritis and are trying to delay or are waiting for joint replacement surgery. Now, how does ob obesity uh, play into this with, with the hips? Because the extra weight, the strain now, everybody knows that when you're in water, you weigh like you know ha half the weight, but um, obesity, does that have a big play in, in, uh, on your hips and, and knees? It does. Obesity has become an epidemic in the United States. And um, more you weigh, more weight goes from the hips, through the hips and through the knees. And um, the pain from the arthritis is more if you, if you have a BMI of uh, more than 35. Um, additionally, if your BMI is high, your risk factors are increased after surgery, which means that the risk of infection is more after surgery for, um, uh, for infection, for um, uh, blood clots, um, and, and many other risk factors increase due to obesity. So that constant strain uh, on the hips and the knees is not good, so it's best to keep your uh, body mass index down, try to keep your, your weight down. Not that everybody can be super thin all the time, but uh, what is the average age for people that, that get hip replacement? So is it all ages or is it just like <coughs> over 40, over 60? So uh, most hip and knee replacements are done in patients in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. However, there is no age that is exempt. I have done uh, hips and knees in patients who are in their early 20s and I've done uh, joint replacements in patients who are in their 80s. I follow the three strike rule for anybody who is a candidate for joint replacement surgery, and this is very important. The most important thing that I consider when um, uh, booking a patient for joint replacement surgery is are they able to do their activities of daily living without pain. That is the first and the most important strike. So if they are not able to do their activities of daily living, then uh, that's a very important strike. The second strike is on examination. I know that the pain is coming from that joint. And the third strike is if the x-rays show arthritis. Um, only if these three strikes come together uh, do I discuss joint replacement surgery with the patient.
Right. So if you have grandma and she can't pick up the grandkids anymore, or she needs, or grandpa needs help getting dressed or getting his shoes on, uh, things like this, the quality of life issues. Absolutely. Those those are, are major factors in going on. Because uh, a lot of people have asked me and said, "Well, you know, I got, you know, I'm pretty sure you hear this all the time. Hey, doc, I got a pain, right? Um, what does arthritis in the hip feel like? I mean, what what are the symptoms? What what should we look for? So arthritis presents as pain." in the joint. It also presents as stiffness in the joint. People are unable to do their activities of daily living like um, going up and down stairs, getting in and out of the car, squatting, getting in and out of the chair is an issue in advanced arthritis. They are unable to walk. They walk with a cane or with crutches or with a walker. Hip arthritis patients walk with a cane in the other hand. So if I have hip arthritis in the right hip, I would be walking with a cane in the left. So there are many ways that arthritis presents to me. And, you know, with the, is it the redness, the swelling, stuff like that, that people would notice? Uh, redness and swelling uh, is a sign of infection, not a typical sign of arthritis. If you have redness and swelling associated with hip pain, with high-grade fever, it's a sign of infection, and that's a reason for somebody to to be evaluated immediately. That person needs to probably go to the ER if they have pain, redness, swelling, inability to move the joint, and high-grade fever, that's a sign of infection. Right. And there can be some real nasty infections that once they get into your joints, they do permanent damage, right? Absolutely, and it's very difficult to eradicate. So we go to through extensive measures to prevent infection during surgery. Now, uh, hip replacement, uh, each, each individual, each patient is different. But uh, I had one question from a woman, <clears throat> was that are women more prone to getting hip arthritis than men? And you had answered this uh, before the show, but I, I'd like it if you could share that with the audience. Sure. Uh, so knee arthritis is more common in females than males. Um, hip arthritis is almost the same in males and females. There are certain conditions which make a patient more likely to have hip arthritis. As an example, um, there's a condition called as hip dysplasia in which the ball and the socket are not congruent. So the ball is not completely covered by the cup. What happens because of that, there are increased stresses in the hip joint and make the hip more prone for arthritis. Similarly, you may have seen uh, patients with bow legs or knock knees. Uh, because of the deformity, more pressure goes from one side of the joint and that joint tends to degenerate and uh, arthritis uh, happens in the joint. Now, we also had a, a question from someone who said, why is it when I go to sleep at night, my hip hurts, but when I'm walking around during the day, I'm fine? So that's a big one for you. So uh, we hear that all the time. With arthritis, especially when patients are sleeping, their muscles are relaxed. And when the raw part of the bone comes in contact with the raw part, the patient suddenly gets pain and wakes up. This is a very common sign of arthritis of the hips and of the knees. Oh, so there's... Uh no real quick remedy for that when, you know, I mean, would people take like a naproxen sodium for something <coughs> like that? Because that would be my next question. You know, what are some of the treatments that are available, uh, you know, until, you know, maybe the replacement is necessary that they can do? Or some of the treatments that you might offer? So arthritis is a progressively deteriorating condition. Uh, eventually, when arthritis this happens, it progresses. So for patients, if they consider how they were last year, this year they will be worse. The year before that would be better than the year to, to, to this year. But um, we have many ways to keep the pain down from the arthritis. What we don't want patients to do is take prescription pain medications for a variety of reasons. Um, intuitively, it makes sense. I have pain. Take pain medications, wrong answer. Because, again, arthritis is a progressively deteriorating condition. You can get hooked on to these pain medications. Uh, most certainly, no narcotic pain medications. The other medications 
um, can spoil the inner lining of your stomach, they can spoil your kidneys. So we don't want patients to be taking medications in the long term. Additionally, when patients need surgery, the pain thermostat is already increased. So after the surgery, they need even more pain medications, then they are not able to cooperate with therapy and the risk of complication increases. So for a variety of reasons, we don't want patients to be taking prescription pain medications or even over-the-counter pain medications. Once in a while, cheating with over-the-counter medications is fine, uh, but not on a regular chronic basis. Yeah, especially One, with the, the opioid crisis and everything else that's going on. And like you said, there's a big trade-off. A lot of people, uh, there's uh, what they call uh, opioid constipation. There's um, or the linings of the intestines, the stomach, the bowel, the colon. Uh, Absolutely. Like you're and Larry, this is a very common mistake even made by physicians. You have pain. All right, let me write you a script for pain medication. Wrong answer. But we have other methods to keep the pain down and keep the patient active. One excellent option is an injection of cortisone. So patients can get an injection of cortisone inside the joint. I mix cortisone with a numbing medication. So when the patient walks out of the door, they have no pain. The numbing medication wears away and the cortisone kicks in in a few days' time. Depending upon how bad the arthritis is, uh, the cortisone can last for weeks to months to years sometimes. There are also other injections like these gel injections or these rooster comb injections yeah, that, you may have that, heard of. That, that was going to be my next question. And they talk about uh, collagen and chicken broth shots or something like that. Right. So that's a different mechanism of action. There are also PRP and stem cells injections, which are still uh, under the research phase. But uh, we do a lot of things to keep the pain down without giving them pain medications. Now, uh, some of these, uh, these like collagen, they say it looks like the, uh, the uh, gelatin that forms on top of your chicken broth or something like that, that there's a purified form that you actually inject into some of these people with uh, you know, knee problems and stuff? That is right. And uh, if done for the right indication, that gives relief for a very long time and can delay the need for joint replacement surgery by months and sometimes by years. Now, as you know, we get to the hips, a lot of people think, oh, it's an old age disease, it's people over 40. You get into the knee, that's, that's fair game for everybody. And uh, one of the questions that we had was uh, about a torn meniscus in the knee. So what is the meniscus in the knee? What, what does it do? What's its function? So meniscus is the cushion between the two bones. And uh, meniscal tears are a very common thing that I see in my practice. Um, uh, isolated meniscal tear uh, in a younger patient with no arthritis is quite different from a meniscal tear in an older patient with arthritis. So meniscal tear with arthritis is part of the arthritic process. So the cushion wears down, the cartilage wears down, and the patient has arthritis. We do not treat these meniscal tears for uh, for the reason that it's part of the arthritic process, okay? We don't do surgery on these meniscal tears for patients who have arthritis. For younger patients where there is no arthritis and when there is a tear in the meniscus, uh, we do surgery in which we remove the diseased part of the meniscus and then patients are good for a very long time. Um, most meniscal tears get better with um, pain pills, uh, like anti-inflammatory medications, again, for a very short time, with physical therapy, with rest, and some time. Only if the meniscal tear does not get better do we consider surgery, and we give uh, many, many weeks for the meniscal tear pain to go away. Very interestingly, the meniscal tear does not heal, but the pain goes away, and that's what matters. Yeah. Now, uh I had been looking up some of the medical books, and just tell me if you concur with this, that people don't understand when they say arthritis and everything. When you take an x-ray of someone's knee, you can tell right away if they have arthritis. And what the doctor is looking for, and maybe you'll explain this a little bit, is that most joints are smooth. And when you get arthritis, it gets rough, like sandpaper. And that is your pain and your problems. Would you say that's pretty much accurate? That is right. So I, the most important thing I want to drive home is that I treat patients and not x-rays or MRIs. And that, okay. that, that, that's very important. <laughs> if a patient has arthritis on the x-ray, 
who cares if the patient does not have pain? We go after treating the patient. So uh, we don't get uh, driven away, you know, by an X-ray report or by an MRI report. Sometimes the patient comes and shows me a report. Oh, this is what my MRI shows. It shows a meniscal tear. <laughs> Do you have pain? No. Then forget about the report. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. And, and interestingly, even if the patient has a big deformity, a deformity cosmetically may not need correction. If there's arthritis associated with the deformity, we don't need to treat the deformity. But when the patient does need joint replacement surgery, we can fix any sort of deformity. The surgical exposure may be a little bit more. The implants needed may be a little bit more. But what we treat essentially is the pain from the arthritis. Now, another common problem with the knee is cartilage damage. How can you tell that if, if like a normal person, that you have cartilage damage? It's not just a touch of arthritis or something else. So arthritis means that the cartilage is worn down and the bone is rubbing on bone. Um, the patients present with symptoms of pain, stiffness. On examination, the range of motion is restricted and there is tenderness on the joint. And on x-ray, you can see that the joint space has decreased. In early arthritis, the x-ray may not show arthritis, but if you get MRI, uh, it shows more clarity on how the cartilage looks. And that's another way to know if the patient has arthritis. Now, are there some other uh, knee ailments that are caused, you know, that just happen without being like a working out on sports or a swimmer or a bowler or somebody who's very physically active? <clears throat> Contrary to popular opinion, Sporting activities don't lead to arthritis. There's a genetic predisposition that causes arthritis. There's so many runners, there's so many active people who never develop arthritis over their entire lifetime. And yet there are some very young patients who have arthritis in their 20s and in their 30s. So sporting activity does not necessarily correlate to having arthritis. Now, uh, with you were talking about the, the younger people in the knee. Uh, besides surgery, the other treatments that you were mentioning, you were talking about shots and stuff for the knee. Are there other th treatments that are available? I know that they're doing a lot of stuff with electronics now and stuff like that for pain. Is this something that you see in the future with medicine going that way? What I see in the future is a big use of stem cells for regenerating cartilage. We're not yet there. In the lab, we have been able to regenerate cartilage there are certain substances which regenerate cartilage in the lab. However, when you take it orally, how much it affects the cartilage in the joint is yet to be resolved. But I see stem cells coming up in a very big way in the next uh, several years and decades. Now, what would cause knee pain without injury? Uh, there are many uh, reasons for getting knee pain without injury. One could be a meniscal tear like we discussed before. Other reasons could be what we call avascular necrosis, which means the blood supply to the part of the joint is cut off. And that can happen because of many genetic disorders. It can happen also due to chronic alcoholism, um, or it could happen without any reason. So if the blood supply to the joint is cut off, it's called avascular necrosis, and that can give rise to sudden onset pain in the knee joint. Now, how would you know that <coughs> you're, you're a good candidate for knee replacement surgery? I follow the three strike rule. Again, back to the three strikes. Okay. The most important thing is pain <laughs> interfering with activities of daily living. Second strike on ex x ray, uh, we see arthritis. And the third strike is on examination. I know the, coming, the pain is coming from that joint. Only if these three strikes come together, I talk about joint replacement surgery. Now, here's one of the most biggest one that people should pay attention to. What can we do <clears throat> ourselves to help prevent hip and knee damage? The most important thing that patients can do is keep their weight down. Maintain a healthy lifestyle. Keep your muscles strong. Do stretching on a regular basis. If the pain continues to bother you, you stop that activity and get yourself evaluated. If there's a problem, nip it in the bud. Now, my next question uh, before we wrap up here is, people say diet has a lot to do with it. 
and constantly on the TV you're seeing these joint pills and seaweed <coughs> and uh, you know um, eating the bark off a tree is going to help you with your joints and stuff. Uh, is this true about the diet? Are there some things that will help your joints or is it just you know old wives tales? I'm not paid by any pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, chondroitin sulfate and MSM are the most common supplements available in the market for arthritis. They have worked well in the lab, in a Petri dish, but the literature is not very strong when you take it orally for hip and knee arthritis. Some people swear mm -hmm. by that and I get it, um, but many trials have shown that the pain and the decrease in pain that happens from the arthritis when you compare just over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications to chondroitin sulfate, it's almost the same. And these medications can cause uh, problems. Some patients may be allergic to yeah, it. I was going to say that. And, and they're costly. So it hasn't really panned out very well. Uh, might as well, you know, take some anti-inflammatory medications. And go going back to our conversation before, we don't want patients to be taking medications at all. Right. When there are excellent options like injections that will keep the patient pain-free for a very long time, sometimes for months and sometimes years. Well, Dr. Kokari, we're basically out of time, but I'm hoping that you're going to come back and do a part two with us. We'll and, look forward to that. And tell us all about more of these things that are going on. We didn't get to touch on the advances in medication and all these other treatments that are now available. But I did want to thank you for coming on. If you have uh, any questions or would like to know a little bit more about Dr. Uh, Kokari, uh, you'll see his website at the end of the program and probably during the program, too. We'll sneak it in there. And uh, he'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Till then, I'm Larry Mike Arenda. We'll see you soon right back here on this channel.